With uh, Street Made also on Death Valley, uh, like we talked about, Scarface is on that. And that, uh, I hope that's not one of his last verses. But, you know, when he's talking well, about. No, he, he, he had said, you know, he's retiring from rap. So that's uh, what I meant by one of his last verses. No, I hope not, too. I'm trying to get I'm... him in the lab to get myself. <laughs> As you should. But one of my favorite lines he had on there is how you got to eat or, or be swallowed or get swallowed. And, you know, I think people really sleep on Be Real in particular as a lyricist. Obviously, you've worked with him for decades. But when you hear someone like Face that's been out since the 80s still dropping those crazy, like visual, insightful, wild lyrics as a producer, as a fan, how does that affect or inspire or move you? Look, man. It's great. It's weird. I used to trip, man, because when I was 18, 30 was old as fuck, right? We never thought we was going to be doing this. Then you get over here and you realize I'm more creative than I was when I was 18. I'm smarter than I was when I was 18. I'm more comfortable in my skin than I was 18. You know, and it's like in pop culture, they're always looking for the next young thing. It doesn't mean it's the next better thing. And when I... I'm inspired, like, there's not anybody in music that really inspires me, man. Like, I'm inspired by, like, Alejandro Jodorowsky or, like, Pablo Picasso. When I look at a Picasso, he's in his, he's in his prime in his 70s, like, prime time. And there's a photo where he's in his loft, probably has, like, 20 paintings he's working on at the same time in his 70s, you know. He's in Italy or in Spain. And um, I'm like, I think we hit our creative peaks in our 50s, you know what I mean? And, I'm like, yo, I can go to direct to people now. Like, dope shit don't get old. Clothes get old. Pop culture can get dated, but artistic shit doesn't get old. You know what I mean? And dope shit and good writing and good lyrics never get old. But, you know, that's why there's classic books that were written 100 years ago that are still the classics that are must reads. And this is what a Scarface is. And this is what an Ice Cube is. You know, and these brothers are still fucking, they still own their crafts, you know, they're still working on it. They're still always exercising that muscle, man. So I think, you know, the written word, it's in, it's in, when you're dope at the written word, it's always going to be dope. You know what I mean? Classic writing is always going to stand the test of time. For sure. And Method Man has another one of my favorite verses on there with Metropolis. Um, you got Ghostface on the album as well with Sicilian Gold. So what, how and why do you think you and the Wu developed such a big uh, relationship back in the day? I think I think we came out, I want to say two years before Wu-Tang. We came out in 91, they came out in 93. But I think, you know, that time, it was us, Wu-Tang, Death Row, you know, Biggie and them, and everybody was just fucking coming with it. And I think, you know, we just built a camaraderie. We was like battling it out, but we had a mutual respect, man. You know, I had a big love for RZA when he was doing. He had a big love and respect for what I was doing. And, you know, like minds, like minded motherfuckers, just connected. You know, so we've always been, we've been, we've been going back and forth since '93. You know what I mean? Since I first hooked up with RZA at his at, at his house in Staten Island when I was down there kicking it with him, and we've been kicking it since then, man. You know, and, and at this time, at this point in my life, I work with every Wu member. You know, I've done so many songs with them, man, and you know. Real shit, real classic shit, and that's what I'm saying. Look at them touring stadiums right now. Greatness stands the test of time, you know. Um, it's legendary shit, classic shit. It isn't motherfuckers putting their album out before it comes out. They sing, yo, it's a classic. It ain't up to you to say it's a classic. In 10 years, we'll know if it's a classic, and the people will let you know. It ain't up to people to say that it's a classic. So we'll see who's going to be around, and, and if your music stands the test of time, or if you was just a flash in the pan with a motherfucking ego, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And and somebody else that stood the test of time you got on Metropolis is Slick Rick. And the thing I was very intrigued from you about was, ironically, a lot of Slick Rick's music is actually very sad, but uh, especially the classic stuff that people know the most is actually sonically very festive and even upbeat, whereas Metropolis is very slow and eerie, and it's a... For the most people, it's a very atypical beat that Slick Rick would be known to rap over. So did he, did did you pick that for him? Did he say, I want an eerie beat? Like, how did that all come together? So I did the meth verse and I had it and I was sitting on it for a few months. 
And then I got invited to um the Soho House in LA. Slick Rick was doing a little Q and A about about the great adventures of Slick Rick. And I seen him there, and we chopped it up after. And he was telling me how Jump Around's his favorite fucking record in the world, and he plays it every fucking show he does. And I was like, Yo, I'm um, working on this album. I got this song on Method Man, and I would love to get you on it if you have time. He was like, I played it for him. He's like, Send me that. Yep, I'm in. And you know. I didn't hear from him for a while, man. And I just checked in and I wasn't sure if it was going to happen. It took about a year. And then when I finally started to sit down and speak with him, he was like, yo, I rewrote it three times because I didn't get the right flow because it was so slow. But then he realized he had to do the triplets and that's what sped it up and gave it that shit. And I was like, oh, because he almost got them. It's like the triplets that Tretch does that for Slick yeah. Rick shit at first. It's almost, it gave me that, it gave me that, but it gave me that feeling. I was like, oh, I see what you did. You sped it up with the triplets. So, and I, man, I'm glad, I'm glad we got that on there, man. Cause he sounded like classic Slick Rick, you know, and um, he murdered it, bro. And them two brothers on that shit. It's just, it sounds brand new, man. It sounds future. And that, uh, and to your point about the industry, I want you to speak about the ability to have that latitude to where you can wait a year for a song and it doesn't affect you. Like, how does that? Well, because I'm not trying to, I, I, I'm doing a, a classic sound that isn't trying to fit in anything that's like hype, you know, like, like fucking hot. Like, I don't give a fuck. So this sound is timeless sound. It could have came out three years ago. It could come out next year. You know, it doesn't matter when it came out because it isn't like, Oh, that's the shit they were doing at that moment in time with that particular sound. You know, it, it isn't. It, you don't date yourself with the production style, so it didn't really matter. If it came out in two more years. That's what classic shit is, right? It's timeless shit. Yeah, and I thought that was incredible too, because on dump on him with MC Ren for you to beat me, it's going to take a miracle. Referencing Big Daddy Kane, that made me think back to the uh, classic there too. Uh, with the eight and a half step and lyrical reference. And Ren, Ren uh, you know, I know Ren. I've hung out with him, been to his house and everything, but he doesn't do a lot of verses. How were you able to get him on there? Bro, I had to be real. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? It was sitting there. That track was sitting there for a while, you know? And uh, I was like, yo, be real in NWA would be sick with Cube and Dre and fucking Ren. So Fred Redhead came by the studio and I was like, yo, you got a line on Ren? Because I know Fred works with him a lot, knows him. He hit Ren up, and Ren was like, yeah, I got you. Let me finish my EP. He had just put an EP out, and then um, we'll get into it. Once he finished his EP, he sent it to me a week later. And I was like, I got to get Cube now. And I was, you know, trying to tap in with Cube. And then all of a sudden, d was touring with him in Australia. And I was like, yo, I need to get Cube on this shit, bro. Can you talk to me? He goes, he's sitting right here. So I sent him the track. And he played it for me. He's like, yo, he said he's he's down. He'll do it when he gets home. Oh, that's so, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's like, it's classic. What we love from them. And, and it's future. And it's fucking mean as fuck. You know what I mean? And that was that's what I wanted to bring. Is that, that fucking shit. Like, like, I wanted that spirit of when we did tear this motherfucker up. You know what I mean? Just that shit. I just want to make you start ripping shit up and smashing shit and doing fucking push-ups and just fucking going fucking crazy. Yeah, and you had done so much great work with Cube, and obviously you guys had beef and stuff, but and now working together again, I want you to speak of the power of being able to move past differences and reunite and, and do things. Yeah, we were just young, fucking young, fucking motherfucking motherfuckers didn't have no social skills. Everything was just fight, you know what I mean? And, um, and motherfuckers mature and smart now, man, and it wasn't shit. We made up with Cube years ago, man, years ago. So the fact we was able to get back in the lab and do this, man, it's like, you know, I was like, yo, I want to do a whole project, bro. So if the time comes, if the time the time comes around and the fucking gods want it to happen, you know, let's see what we can do. Because I don't know what to do for Cube. Just, I'm like, bro, we don't even try to sell records. We just make an art piece. That's all we need to do. We don't need money. We just make the fucking illest fucking record you ever heard. And, you know, and that, that would, that's what the goal would be. So We'll see where, where what happens in the future. So when did it when did this epiphany or when did this happen to you where you artistically, creatively, personally were able to approach music like I'm just gonna do a hundred percent what I want to do instead of at all thinking about any commercial appeal of it? I never did. I, I, I didn't think about my whole career was like that until about the 
fifth Cypress album. It was just like, when you're such a big Cypress machine, bro, the label wants, you're getting fucking million, two million dollar marketing budgets. You know, the label wants a hit. And we, you want hits. And it's just the way you come out because once you're so big, you can't come back underground again. You got to come bigger every time. You know what I mean? It's just the way it is. So that's what that did, you know. And then it's, I got bored. My, it just got boring. And then, you know, now I'm back here. So I've been here 35 years. So I'm going to go through a fucking period for five, six years sometimes. You know, some motherfuckers have a five year career. So having gone through all these different things and all these different things, man, being able to have longevity and land on your fucking feet, you know, that's just fucking skill set in itself. Just surviving this many years is a skill set, just fucking living out here. But, you know, it's that, man. And, you know, being able to just be inspired, man, and love what I do. Um, always challenge myself, always stay uncomfortable, always trying to keep learning and be a student of this shit, figure shit out. And, and like I said, man, um, I've been rich for fucking 35 years, bro, beyond belief. And um, I, I never cared about being famous and being in photo. So those two things ain't my motivation. My motivation is pure creativity, and I get the most fun of, of making shit and inventing shit, and and then, you know, and then I, I do it for me. Everything I do is for me. It just happens that fifty million motherfuckers like what I did. You know what I mean? But everything I'm doing in the lab is for me. I don't give a fuck what's going on. I don't compete with nobody but myself. I don't give a fuck what y'all do. You know what I mean? I I, I laugh at a lot of these motherfuckers. They'll be on their little posts like, "Y'all ain't ready for this. It's coming. It's it's a classic." And I'm like, this "Shit ain't even out. They just want." Motherfuckers just want to get some likes, you know what I mean? Everybody to fucking wave pom poms with them, and I'm like, we'll see, bro. Y'all motherfuckers, we'll see. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> also with your longevity on the outro of the album, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> on the outro of the album too, you have the segment where it's like it's hard to push out the real, which I thought was amazing and also reflects perfectly into everything we're talking about. But when when those type of things are being said, how do you know to pull those to put them on a project? What do you mean? Uh, just I think that was Spanto that said that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my boy. I don't know, man. Everything just comes to everything's just instinctual and taste and where your where your mind is in the moment. You know what I mean? That's my, my boy Spanto. R.I.P. Just passed away, and um, right. You know, I, I featured him on the album a few times. You know, I got a lot of friends doing um, but. The, the, you know, the, the city came out for Sponto, you know, and a lot of got a lot of artists on boys that are doing murals around town and around the world. And I don't do murals, but this is I paint with with sound, you know what I mean? So I'm going to incorporate him in all my and all my works moving forward. You know, he came in the studio and recorded a lot of things for me over the years, drops and talking on songs. And I used bits of it, but I didn't use a lot of it. So I got enough stuff, of, you know, years of music with him talking. So I'm going to start incorporating him. And, and that, that was just some classic shit he said that I thought fits you know because i wanted to incorporate my crew in the interlude so you have a cartoon on an interlude i got a stev on i got fucking sponto and them talking on the outro you know and when he said those were some classic lines you know what i mean yeah and the album ends with nothing is ever really finished but it feels complete so that's a david lynch quote yeah so how how do you deal with that as a creative person as a businessman it's well, it's an art, man. Somebody told me long ago when I first started making music, and I was in a studio with Joe the Butcher, and he was like, Muggsy, he goes, We can, you, there's an art to knowing when it's done because you could work on the song forever, you know. And some people don't know when to stop, think about it. And, and some people, even in business, they drive past the money. So there's an art when knowing when knowing when to stop, you know. So I know when it feels right to me, it's just, it's just a feeling, you know. Um, so. I'm 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 not technical man with music at all, bro. I'm all I'm all feelings, you know. I just go. I've always gone by what feels right to me, and everybody goes that way. I want to go that way. I've always been like that, man. I always take the left-handed path. 